Welcome to join the Thames South South Forum on Sustainability. Apart from the uh, Zoom webinar, we will also uh, the, uh, do the live streaming in Putonghua for a Chinese audience. For friends on Zoom, please click the group icon and select your preferred language. I thank today's interpreters, Huang Xiaomei and Dong Han Yu. My name is Sichui Jardine Margaret. I'm Associate Professor at the Institute for Rural Revitalization Strategy at Southwest University, China. I'm also a founding member of Global University for Sustainability. I have been actively involved in the rural reconstruction movement in China since 2000 year. Working together with Professor Lao Qingqi, I am coordinating the programs of the South South Forum. We start the first South South Forum on Sustainability in 2011. In the past nine forums, every section was video recorded and uploaded for free access on our websites. For this 10th South South Forum on Sustainability, the central theme is Thinking New Horizons to go beyond uh, habitual frames of thought and action in order to foster new approaches and form a strong alliance of hope of the South. Uh, we need new horizons of thinking. Today, we have the fourth webinar on Against Health for All, 30 Years of Health Financialization, which is particularly co-organized with the Society for International Development based in Italy. May I introduce the moderator, Nicoletta Dentico, who is a senior public health advocate for a long experience in international cooperation and people and planet-centered development. She has worked as consultant for the World Health Organization on access to medicines. She currently leads the Global Health Justice Program, a society for international development. She has written extensively on the rights to health and global health governance. Now I pass the floor to Nicoletta. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Jade Margaret Sitin. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. Welcome, welcome to today's uh, online debate on uh, this important topic of financialization of development and global health. Uh, wherever you are in the world, welcome, really welcome. Uh, this event uh, uh, is uh, organized, uh, as you know already, in the context of the 10th South-South Forum on Sustainability. And I'm really thrilled and happy to be here uh, to share this opportunity of uh, this discussions, debate, and political exchanges with you all. Um, let me start by expressing my deepest gratitude to the organizers uh, of, and particularly to Lao Qingqi and uh, Jade Margaret, with whom I have had the privilege of past collaborations for giving SID the space today, allowing us to kind of set the scene for this discussion on global health. Um, well, uh, the um, Alma Aga, uh, in, in 1978, uh, the Alma Ata uh, declaration was uh, basically stating that uh, uh, a new economic order, a new international economic order was uh, indispensable to guarantee the right to health and health for all, uh, and that the in interaction between uh, this right and a just economic order was the condition for making health for all happen. We have uh, uh, the, the, this close correlation, which uh, has uh, been uh, so important and has been so visible, uh, the close correlation between the quality of the international economic order and the realization of the right to health, which has been pioneered in the Alma Ata Declaration, has uh, manifested itself uh, very clearly during the past years uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen this correlation everywhere in the world, wherever we were. Yet, only a few years, after the mobilizing uh, 
pronouncements of the ATA conference in 1978, which was a setting held for all as the primary horizon for enabling human and economic development, financial institutions started to become gradually key drivers of the world this order, economic this order. This trend, this movement has actually challenged deeply the Alma-Ata sense of direction. Finance started to make money from money by shaping markets for the buying and selling of credits and debts. Finance has gained unprecedented influence over our lives subjugating health goals to shareholder values, to market fluctuations and failures. We have seen that during the financial crisis and the austerity measures that have followed, particularly in the case of Greece, but not only for the whole world. After the pandemic, the discourse about health for all seems to have gained new meanings and also a new sense of urgency. But in the meantime, in these 30 years that we have, uh, in a way, conventionally uh, defined uh, since the beginning, uh, since the launch of the World Bank report on investing in health in 1993, in these 30 years, health has been completely transfigured. And the moral economy of health interventions has also been transfigured. Now, health financialization has grown in complex and very creative ways, and it is still growing, as we shall see today through our, the panelists that are going to speak about this, through the creation of new asset classes for private investment and bonds, through the institutionalization of medical knowledge monopolies, through the expansion of markets and financial techniques applied to health insurance schemes, and also through the capitalization of development aid. The intentional involvement of the private for-profit sector in healthcare, often under the travesties uh, of modernized uh, overseas uh, development assistance makes it difficult today to set a very clear line between the separate arenas of health financialization and its specific profit motives and also health privatization and health financing. These are separate and yet converging arena today. There are a lot of uh, intersections that, uh, we, that we will see that are stratify, stratified in uh, new contractual governance arrangements that are now used to tackle global health needs. New arrangements in which health strategies, distributive schemes, practical ethics of healthcare and decision-making prerogatives are progressively being outsourced to private entities, to the private sphere, almost uh, in a way, in, a, in kind of a self-privatization of the state. Now, as we have seen during uh, COVID-19 through the failed international allocation of vaccines to counter the contagion, this uh, expanding policy inclination towards the private sector is totally unfit to offer legitimate solutions to the tensions that exist today between the profit maximization imperatives of private finance and the long term investments that are essential to advance health for all, as Alma Ata was actually stating. Whereas a healthy and sustainable environment 
inhabited by a healthy population should be the ultimate purpose of economic activity, health still today continues to be seen as a variable of economic equation and indeed a marginal area of economic policies dissociated from the contribution that it makes to enhancing the social fabric of any given society. Even after COVID-19, the perception remains firm that health is a cost that governments may outsource or uh, hand over to the private financial powers in exchange for new profit-making possibilities. Last week, two recent reports which have been released by Oxfam powerfully revealed the sickening consequences of these assumptions, consequences that create death and disease for people, patients, for their families, and they completely change the roots of lives for millions of peoples in the world. Now, the process of making health dependent on financial markets was uh, very much prodded even during COVID. Uh, it was uh, done in the name of actually containing the new, the new coronavirus. And also it was prodded by the expansion of digital technologies that were used abundantly during the pandemic. As it happens with other sectors, the expansion of financial markets for health is not only about the volumes of financial trading, it is also about the huge diversity of transactions and market players that come on board in their intersections with the various segments of economy and society. Now, the phenomenon which is heralded today under the banner of the 2030 Agenda and the provision of universal health coverage presents a critical uh, sorry, presents a range of critical implications in terms of health governance and policy priorities, in terms of corporate sector monopolies, in terms of the cultural and the political redefinition of the way in which the universal right to health should be interpreted, should be pursued in the context of a sharp decline in democratic accountability. So we are confronted today, and I'm coming to the end of uh, this uh, introduction of mine, with uh, one arena, health financialization, that is often neglected. Uh, it is a very complex arena, but which uh, the former independent UN rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights, Philip Alson, only last week redefined as the, I quote, the single most important challenge that global public health is facing today, extreme profit extraction from health and health in its own rights. So we have four fabulous speakers today to actually give us a representation of this prismatic dimension of health financialization. And with them, I think we are in a perfect position to think new horizons also, to do a good diagnosis, but also to think really bravely a bit out of the box. Before I give them the floor, I would like to perhaps share a few housekeeping rules. I hope that we can you know, all be muted, except for the panelists that are speaking. I hope that in the chat and the Q&A box, you will be sharing your comments, uh, your questions, but also any document, any uh, you know, relevant piece of uh, uh, literature that uh, you think it's uh, necessary to share, useful to share for uh, the uh, purpose of this uh, conversation. I think uh, it's uh, also important to uh, invite all of you to participate, to take the floor, to raise your hands, I want to thank the interpreters uh, for the activity that they will be doing in the coming two hours. 
And I really wish to thank once again the organizers of this webinar and the, 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 the organizers of the South South Sustainability Forum and the speakers for accepting my invitation to be with us today. And uh, therefore, I will start with uh, Marco Angelo from Guemos. Marco uh, Angelo is a medical doctor by training. Uh, he had, uh, as a medical doctor, an important uh, series of experiences uh, and got attracted by global health, so much so that he became uh, part of the team uh, working on the financial uh, financial institutions and the financialization of health. And today is one of the uh, best researchers and uh, uh, really a uh, uh, person, one of those who goes and studies and maps and uh, you know codifies many of the numbers and the trends that are happening, especially with the uh, international financial institutions. So Marco, you have the floor. I know you have a, a presentation. Uh, you have the floor and you have your slot now. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Gannon. And, and thank you for to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present here. So I wanted to start by talking about um, uh, healthcare financialization in general. Uh, uh, how it's promoted through development, uh, the institution that promote it, in particular the IOC. Uh, and I will talk a little bit also uh, about uh, blended finance, uh, uh, which is a form of uh, financialization uh, and how it applies in health and its consequences. Um, so, just uh, uh, to be on the same page, I wanted to uh, introduce the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank. As such, the IFC has the role of uh, fostering private sector development uh, by uh, investing and uh, technical advice. And it has an active portfolio in health which has been growing uh, in the last uh, few years, especially since uh, 2020, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and, uh, but the IFC doesn't just invest uh, in the health sector, it also uh, brings in private finance uh, into the health sector, into development, through a process that, uh, I call uh, development financialization. Um, so the story is, uh, uh, the narrative is very simple. Um, so there are governments that don't, don't have money to uh, pursue the development goals, like providing healthcare to everyone, uh, like um, um, providing education, uh, lowering their uh, the, the CO2 emissions, etc. Um, and on the other hand, there are uh, private investors that are seeking for uh, 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 chances to invest their money and to get financial returns. So what the IFC uh, and the other financial institutions do uh, is uh, to turn development projects into financial assets. Um, so bonds, loans, uh, equity firms, uh, where uh, private uh, investors can invest, can put their money and get a financial return. Um, so for me, financialization is really key. Uh, it's the gener generation of financial assets through development assistance. This can be done in various ways. Um, uh, here I'm, I have some examples. Um, Public-private partnerships, which uh, Maria Jose uh, will describe later, uh, which are basically private companies uh, that belong to investors uh, and uh, are contracted by governments um, um, through the generation of uh, development impact bonds, and that also generate uh, a large financial returns from uh, for investors um, by uh, bringing in more and more investment funds, equity funds, 
uh, that which then we invest in development and in healthcare uh, in this case, and through blended finance, uh, which is uh, uh, the last one of the uh, latest creature of, of, of financialization. Uh, and it's um, uh, basically means the, the risking, the use of development finance to the risk uh, private investment. Um, so the NFC um, intervenes in many of these areas. For example, it provides advisory services to governments who want to set up public-private partnerships and uh, helping them with the contracts, with the tendering process. Uh, it gives it it invests money. It buys share into equity funds that then invest in the health sector, uh, and uh, it uh, uses its uh, technical and financial capacity to set up blended finance facilities. Um, so let's talk, let's talk a little bit uh, about blended finance. And what it is? Um, so as I mentioned before. Blended finance is the use of development finance to the risk uh, private uh, private investments. Um, so um, development finance, uh, 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 I call development finance all the money that is normally directed to governments uh, to provide uh, public services like healthcare, education, um, uh, which is redirected. Um, through various mechanisms, uh, in this case, in the case of the ISC, to the private sector windows, into um, the risking private sector investments. Um, so basically, uh, the story uh, is very similar. Um, we have private financial investors who want to invest in health uh, and healthcare uh, and healthcare facilities, private hospitals that need financing, uh, but in low and middle income countries, investments are perceived as very risky. So as very risky, so private investors want to invest. Um, and what the IFC aims to do uh, through blended finance is to provide guarantees to investors. Um, so if uh, the companies cannot repay the loans, goes bankrupt, uh, this blended finance uh, will absorb uh, uh, the losses or the majority of the losses. Uh, in this way, private investors can be confident in investing in, uh, in healthcare, uh, in healthcare companies, uh, so the private healthcare sector can grow. Um, to make it a bit more practical, I wanted to talk uh, about the first example of blended finance in health, which is the Africa Medical Equipment Facilities facility, which was set up first in Kenya and now it's being set up uh, in uh, Senegal and and Cote d'Ivoire. And the uh, the idea is to expand it uh, into as many African countries as possible. Um, this uh, financing facility was created uh, in 2021 since the, uh, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's the first blended finance facility in the health sector. So the idea behind this was that uh, a lot of private healthcare providers, uh, especially small healthcare providers, um, don't have enough equipment uh, to buy medical to, to serve the patients, and they also don't have access to financing to purchase the medical equipment. Um, so um, the idea is uh, behind this facility was to bring together local banks, private healthcare providers, and manufacturers of medical equipment, uh, and uh, uh, there is the loans from the banks to the private providers who can then purchase uh, medical equipment. Um, and the idea, uh, because we are talking about the development finance, is to support local manufacturers uh, and to support 
uh, small uh, healthcare centers that despite being private are, uh, according to the narrative of the World Bank, are the hospitals that um, take care of even of low income groups um, and and uh, and uh, yeah, serve poor population. And I want to put emphasis on that because uh, it went exactly the other way around. Um, so uh, the needs for these uh, blended finance facilities is to make the loans attractive for private investors. This means that uh, the loans need to be sufficiently large. Um, there are high technical requirements in terms of financial planning, uh, in terms of uh, technical capacity also of the healthcare workers. Um, um, so th this means that um, uh, these loans, uh, in order to be attractive, they needed to be for expensive equipment. They couldn't be for very cheap equipment, which is what is mostly pro uh, produced by local uh, manufacturers. Uh, so we are talking about MRI, uh, CT machines, uh, and even more advanced uh, technology. Um, um, and also uh, it required sufficient returns on, on investments, which meant high interest rates. Um, all these meant that basically um, the companies that in the end had access to the services of these facilities were only um, large private hospitals uh, serving high income population. Uh, local manufacturers were not eligible uh, uh, in this, for, this, for the services of this facility and the facility only involved manufacturers from uh, uh, the US and Europe. Um, so very little loans were dispersed and only to, to high-end private hospitals. Um, so we had uh, a complete, uh, uh, so the, the purpose of this facility was completely turned up upside down and it ended up only financing private large hospitals uh, to buy equipment uh, from uh, companies like Philips and General Electric, so not actually helping local manufacturers, but uh, actually uh, supporting uh, the competition, so to say. Um, um, so um, just some final remarks. Um, um, basically, uh, what we are seeing here is that uh, financialization is being actively pushed by, by development institutions. Um, but rather than addressing uh, uh, development gaps, ra ra rather than bringing in uh, additional, uh, additional resources to support development, um, we have a system that is set up to create opportunities for investors. Uh, to get a financial return. Um, and what I want to stress uh, is that um, uh, this is a, an increasing trend. Eh? Uh, I mean, we, we have seen more and more uh, financialization being used to address the, 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 the finance uh, gap uh, in development. Um, I think I'm done. Um, I'm, uh, I hope I was uh, within the limits of time. Yes, you were Thank indeed. You, you were indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marco. Thank you for uh, uh, opening up uh, the, you know, <laughs> present, unpacking what's behind uh, financialization uh, and uh, especially uh, showing uh, uh, the some of uh, uh, your interpretation on of uh, financialization uh, is uh, you know related to development of financial asset through development assistance of course uh, this is how financialization very much is undertaken and is pursued 
in the context of global health, but of course, financialization of health is also, uh, you know, has also broader implications. However, I think uh, uh, you introduced uh, immediately important notions like blended finance, uh, the question of uh, the risking, the risking the private, uh, the private investors, uh, and uh, the role that the public sector plays uh, in this arena, uh, including, of course, uh, actually starting from the international financial institutions that keep promoting uh, this uh, pathway. So thank you for this. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that we will get back uh, to, to your uh, points uh, uh, later. And uh, I would now like uh, to give the floor to Maria Jose Romero. Uh, Maria Jose Romero is a, a PhD candidate in international development at the SOAS University of London. She is uh, the policy and advocacy management manager on development of finance uh, at the European Network on Development, Eurodad, uh, which is a Brussels-based uh, development organization. She has also published uh, very much a lot of uh, uh, documents. She's done extensive research on uh, private finance, uh, development uh, finance institution, and uh, public and private partnerships uh, uh, to uh, you know, uh, support uh, infrastructures uh, and services. Um, Maria Jose, I'm very happy to give you the floor. You have the floor now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicoletta, and good evening, uh, good afternoon uh, to, to everyone. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers uh, for, for this opportunity. Um, I uh, will be uh, focusing my uh, intervention today on the financialization of uh, healthcare. And I will um, uh, go deep into the role of the World Bank Group and the rise uh, of uh, health public-private partnerships. I hope that this follows quite nicely from, from Marco's presentation. Um, I uh, have uh, uh, five uh, main uh, points to, to share with you today, plus some uh, references that I um, included in my last slide uh, for you to uh, continue the reading on, on some of these things. The first point, uh, uh, it's about the changing narratives and, and practices of, of development finance in a pre and post COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, context. I, I will uh, include some general reflections on that. Then I will get into the, the role of the World Bank Group um, as, a health, as a key health uh, market maker through the promotion of public-private partnerships. Um, I will get into um, what uh, PPPs um, are um, and um, the way in which they are promoted as a silver bullet for, for development and, and for health in particular. Um, and I will expand on some of the impacts uh, that PPPs have for the, for the right to health. And I will conclude with some remarks for you to take home. Um, so, um, with regards to the changing narratives and practices um, uh, of development finance in, in this pre and post COVID-19 um, context, I think that uh, it's important to, to uh, place ourselves in what has been uh, the main trend over the last decade, um, because we have seen um, a very strong uh, uh, push for an increasing role of, of the private sector and of private finance in particular. So we have witnessed a, a private turn in, in development finance with significant implications for the universalization of health uh, provision, right? Uh, there has been a strong narrative um, that um, got even uh, uh, stronger at the time um, of the um, agreement on the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, because this requires a massive investment. Uh, 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 the, the, the needs are, are huge, and there is no doubt about that. Um, and, but this narrative also comes uh, with um, a strong uh, claims that public finance is not enough, right? And therefore we need to um, uh, fill in a, a huge uh, gap, a huge financing gap 
uh, that needs to be filled uh, as a consequence with private finance, right? And that's why there is um, quite a lot of rhetoric um, um, that elevates the concept of leveraging, right? It's about using public money to uh, leverage uh, private finance. Um, and this is the concept of de-risking that um, was mentioned um, uh, by, by, by Marco and, and Nicoletta uh, before, right? Uh, to, to be able to leverage, we, we need to lower the risk for private investment, for, for private investors. But what I want to emphasize in this first slide, so just right from the beginning, is that this is a political choice. Uh, that reflects, the, uh, on the one hand, the, the, the unwillingness of the international community to scale up and strengthen uh, public uh, financing of, of development, right? Um, and uh, there are many different things associated to, to that, including the bleeding of resources from the north, uh, sorry, from the south to, to the north. Uh, uh, so th this has to be, uh, place in, in, in context, right? I think that we, we should not take this official narrative uh, as, a, as a given or, you know, as, as uh, th this is a political choice. Um, and this was very much present before COVID. When COVID came, it exposed um, its, um, its failures. So the dramatic impact of um, a trend that was very much present. And in February 2022, we came into a context of a poly crisis, right? Um, so multiple crises interacting uh, and making the context even, even more, more complex. While we have seen calls for reform uh, and, and ambitious responses, uh, actions from multilateral development banks and the international community has fallen short and has even reinforced previous problematic narratives and, and practices, including a reliance on, on private finance. So the, the World Bank Group, um, uh, I, I argue in, 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 a, in a publication that was um, uh, released in 2020, has uh, cited uh, the crisis as an opportunity to intensify its promotion of private finance for, for development and, and notably for, for health, despite the limited evidence of its uh, benefits. Now we are in a context in which fiscal um, headroom uh, and debt capacity of developing countries, um, uh, it's even more, more limited. So this comes as a renewed rationale for further uh, promoting private sector uh, solutions. And I will get into that uh, exactly now because I, I would like to get into uh, what's exactly the role that the World Bank Group has played um, over the years and is actually playing in, in the context of health. And, and this is uh, quite a lot about this concept of health market uh, maker, uh, because the World Bank uh, has been playing multiple and interconnecting uh, roles in support of an agenda focused on increasing private sector participation in, in in healthcare, particularly through public-private partnerships, but 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 not not only right as as uh, Marco also um, illustrated before, and and this influence has taken different uh, shapes, different forms. Um, so to start with, the World Bank has used its finance through budget support uh, throughout the years to promote market-led sectorial reforms in the, in, in, in the health sector uh, and to, to shape the national regulatory framework to attract, to attract uh, private, private finance, right? Uh, this is one uh, way uh, of exerting its influence. The second one is that it has provided financial support for a specific um, healthcare uh, uh, private sector uh, projects and uh, PPPs in, in particular, both in-country projects and also global health uh, public-private partnerships. And also to private equity funds uh, that invest in the health sector so they play the intermediary role. Number three, the World Bank has also influenced global health policy with managerial economic ideas, 
um, and promoting a what works type of uh, agenda by seeking to institutionalize its narrative around best, best practices. Right? The, the, the World Bank has been very active throughout the years on, on that. And lastly, the World Bank uh, IFC, the International Finance Corporation, has increasingly played uh, a thought leadership role. They, they call it that way. They are very explicit. And they want to claim that they, they, they play this role by producing different outputs um, throughout with, uh, through, through, uh, through which they uh, highlight the relevance of private finance to deliver on healthcare uh, objectives. Um, and through this uh, specific output and also through the advisory service that the IFC uh, delivers, um, the, the corporation has been progressively emphasized its work to create uh, markets, right? It's work upstream, uh, they, they, they call it that way, it's because it's not at the project level, it's at, at the level of creating markets for these projects to happen later on, right? And these have to be profitable projects. They, 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 they don't want to, um, um, to, to look for other projects, right? They are looking for uh, projects that are profitable projects for the private sector to invest. And I would like to give uh, an example. Uh, the case of Kenya, um, it's, it's a very uh, um, relevant example to look at because the promotion uh, and the activity of the bank has been very explicit uh, through all these different channels that I have highlighted. Um, uh, the promotion of increased private participation in healthcare match uh, private actors' interest in expanding their role in Kenya um, uh, healthcare, in some cases with the support of donor agencies, right? Uh, in the case of the, ne the, ne the Netherlands, in the case of the US, and, and Wemos has also uh, been doing quite a lot of very interesting research on the case of, uh, of, of, of Kenya. And um, there are many other uh, country cases that follow the same, the same pattern, right? So um, there is um, a market that has been created for health, and there are a lot of companies interested in tap into these business opportunities. So the World Bank, uh, as I um, I at the beginning, has worked as a health market maker and facilitator of financialization of healthcare, which has uh, not changed after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, there are some um, uh, research that points into um, into that specific uh, uh, feature, right? So um, after um, analyzing the work of uh, the, the, the World Bank Group, let's get into uh, what public-private partnerships actually are and why they have been so uh, instrumental uh, uh, of, of this uh, specific uh, uh, trend, right? So um, public-private partnerships are being promoted as the financing tool that will deliver infrastructure and social services, including healthcare, um, because there is an assumption that PPPs might help overcome uh, some key challenges, including uh, insufficient uh, funds for planning and, and project selection. So we are in front of an arrangement in which private sector companies replace the state as the provider of traditional public services, including healthcare, and where the public and the private sector agree uh, by signing on a, a very long-term contract, we are talking about 20, 30 years sometimes, um, they agree on, on, in this contract on how to distribute the risk associated with the, with the project, right? This is the, the definition of what a PPP um, uh, is, right? But, but it's very important that we see um, the promotion of PPPs as a wedge, right? In how the policy space around public service provision is being redefined with important repercussions over and above their uh, sometimes relatively small immediate uh, financial uh, significance. And by this, I mean, uh, it's not just about the number of PPP projects or the amount of money that, um, that, that it's the most significant thing to, to look at uh, when we see the role of the bank, 
the promotion of PVPs and how they are elevated as a silver bullet, right? It's, it's everything that comes with this work that I mentioned before in terms of creating markets um, and uh, making health um, uh, uh, something that um, uh, can be uh, purchased, right? Uh, and something that also can be trade. Uh, uh, and here it comes the concept of financialization and how everything um, uh, it's being financialized. So efforts to promote PPPs point to clear attempt to increase the involvement of private finance in development and have resulted in concrete changes in how laws, policies, and um, uh, development and, and sectorial plans are, are designed. So um, in my academic uh, um, uh, life and also in my, with my civil society hat, I have been doing some research on uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, Eurodad um, coordinated two specific uh, uh, reports with case studies um, on uh, public-private partnerships, some of them covering um, the health sector. Um, and that's why we have some um, key findings to, to share. Um, the main one is, um, and this is also uh, very much reflected in the academic literature on, on PPPs, um, and it's that uh, they are, um, or that they come with a high fiscal and, and human cost, right? All too often, PPPs come at, at a very high cost for the public purse, and, and an excessive level of risk uh, uh, for the public sector, right? There are uh, costs that increase. There are costs that are uh, hidden costs and that materialize for different reasons. And then uh, the uh, amount, the cost of a particular project, it's uh, way more expensive than initially uh, anticipated. This has actually res uh, resulted in a very questionable questionable diversion of public resources. Uh, PPPs in the health sector introduce commercial imperatives uh, in the delivery of healthcare that can actually undermine the right to health. Uh, women um, uh, have often suffered the most. And, and the uh, research that Nicoletta uh, mentioned at the very beginning that was released by Oxfam uh, just last week point to some of the uh, very dramatic experiences that women have um, had to deal with uh, when it comes to um, um, hospitals, private for-profit for hospitals, some of them uh, PPP hospitals as well. So the reliance on, on health PPPs risk uh, undermining progress on universal health coverage altogether, um, as PPPs are likely to, to worsen people's access to, to essential um, health services. And I would also argue that PPPs constitute not only privatized healthcare, but financialized uh, healthcare. Uh, in practice, extending the reach of, of financial private actors, uh, because some of them intervene in the consortiums that, that manage uh, PPP uh, hospitals or projects. Um, and uh, they, they certainly play a, a, a very important role in. Uh, as, as investors in, in, these, in these projects. This translates into a reality where financial players are, are very powerful, uh, powerful enough to influence the types of uh, healthcare available to, to people in need. Um, through the process of financialization, healthcare becomes another sphere through which global finance can extend its uh, value capture with significant implications for uh, inequalities. And here I will conclude with some remarks uh, in relation to uh, the, role, the role of PVPs and the promotion of PVPs in this specific uh, context, in particular by the World Bank Group. So uh, the promotion of PVPs in healthcare contributes to increasing the exposure of national healthcare systems to globalized finance, uh, it is critical to strengthen public health systems and remove financial barriers to accessing uh, healthcare, including uh, the removal of uh, health uh, user fees. 
Um, it's very important, as I stressed at the very beginning, to think about um, what other um, um, choices of financing healthcare are uh, available. And um, public services need to be financed um, with domestic uh, resources. Uh, there, is a, there is a very strong need for international concessional public finance and, and for systemic solutions to address some of the problems that undermine developing countries' ability to um, get the resources that they actually need, right? Um, there is a need uh, for rich countries to deliver on their aid commitments. There is a need to, to find um, sustainable uh, solutions to address uh, debt problems. Um, there is also a need to um, fight illicit financial flows. Um, and there is uh, a need to uh, uh, get a meaningful reform of the international financial architecture, including the governance of the World Bank and the IMF, among many other um, uh, things that are related to that. So I will conclude just uh, by saying that in the wake of the multiple and interconnected crisis, the promotion of PPPs is a full solution. The World Bank plays a very problematic role in promoting that agenda. And this needs to be challenged with a strong call for public service. Thank you very much. And this is the last slide with uh, some academic references that I can, uh, or civil society reference that I can also share with you and the organizers later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Jose. Thank you for your very important presentation. Uh, let me just, uh, you know, select a few comments uh, that uh, have emerged. Uh, you talk about the World Bank as uh, being a, a market maker, and that is true at national level. But I think you will also agree that behind this market market making, there is a very uh, a rather close system, a very compacted system of uh, uh, individuals and institutions that are at interplay with one another. They are usually the same people and the same entities. They have a, a, a very strong network of correlation. They are a networked kind of club. Uh, and they are all entrenched in webs of uh, financial connections, political connections, policies connections. So on the one hand, uh, you know, we're talking about a market, but on the other hand, we're talking about a very close mon ol oligopolic uh, system, or if not a monopoly a monopoly of policies and finance that are actually delivering all of this. The second, uh, the second thing that I would like to say is that uh, uh, in this uh, important story about uh, PPPs, we cannot in any way underestimate the role of civil society organizations. Many NGOs have actually opened their arms to PPPs in the name of uh, inclusion, of multi-stakeholderism, you know, of a, a shift in governance that many are considering today as a natural event, and it is not. So the question is that we are uh, confronted with the public administrations that in the past two, 20 years, more or less, have been divided by diseases with the Millennium Development Goals, and then now are also, you know, uh, further fragmented through the projectification, what I would call the projectification of global health, which is a very serious uh, threat. And final, yes, uh, the exposure, I think you have very well highlighted the exposure of individual citizens to the globalized finance and the volatility of global finance, just uh, to achieve uh, and implement what is their universal right. So, you know, we are financializing this uh, fundamental uh, right, uh, and, and that is uh, really uh, something that we need to keep on uh, thinking about because health is the foundational right even of the UN. It was approved eight months before. It was the first constitutionalized right and the first institutional right in the UN, in the UN system. So thank you for, for this. And uh, I will now uh, give uh, the floor to uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Hugh McLeur. Uh, who will actually, uh, you know, uh, give us a, a, a perfect illustration of this uh, very closed uh, system of interconnection at the financial level. Sarah Hughes McClure 
holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge. Her research has focused on innovative development finance with a particular interest in health. And we're very grateful for her and on this and for her writing. Currently, she works at the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva as an innovative finance officer. And she was previously, and interestingly, Sarah, a consultant at the Boston Consulting Group. So uh, I give you the floor. I'm very happy to, to have you here because you've done uh, simply fantastic research work on the story that you of vaccine bonds that you're going to tell us all about. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the introduction, and, and very much also for the invitation, Nicoletta. And thanks for the organizers for putting together um, for putting together this panel. Today I'm going to talk about an example of innovative finance for global health and the vaccine bonds, and then look at some of the hidden costs of financialization. And as Nicoletta said, this is based on my uh, PhD research. Um, which is, and, and I want to quickly um, set the scene of the context of the research was really looking into the increased role of private finance in development and the financialization of development and healthcare more specifically. We see calls for this uh, specifically in one of the SDGs in the UN that wants to unlock the transformative power of trillions of dollars of private resources specifically, the World Bank's from billions to trillions mantra, and then also in an academic context, research on the financialization of development, movement beyond aid, and a shift towards development finance. And here I uh, added the focus on new innovative uh, development finance schemes, of which today I want to talk about one case study that I um, have written up also with my uh, supervisor on IFIM, the International Finance Facility for Immunization. And this is based on research using a follow the money approach, which I developed also as part of my PhD. So why look at IFIM? Well, it's really a, a very interesting example of the financialization of global health. It's an, very much an emblematic example of innovative development finance, and it's celebrated in both the development world and in the finance world. In terms of scale, it's a really significant and important actor in global health on the world um, stage. And then more recently, it was used as a funding vehicle for COVID-19 vaccines and specifically also for the COVAX AMC, which I'm looking forward to hearing more about from Felix in the next uh, talk. So very quickly, what IFIM is doing is raising funding or providing funding in support of Gavi. So I want to quickly say a word on who Gavi are so that we're all at the same starting point, that Gavi is the uh, public-private partnership as we just heard about, that brings together a range of important actors in the health space, the WHO, UNICEF, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Bank, many donors and implementing country governments, vaccine manufacturers and other private sector partners. So it, the significance in terms of scale of Gavi is, is um, large in the sense that it, it claims to vaccinate almost half of the world's children against infectious diseases. So it has a very bit significant reach and its biggest donors historically have been the UK, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the US and Norway. It's important to note there have been some um, interesting and important critiques of Gavi and the way it works, but we'll, I won't um, go into those in the scope of this talk today. Where I want to focus on IFIM, which is this innovative funding mechanism targeting immunization specifically. And what, what IFIM is in terms of size is that it's secured over $8 billion in donor commitments from 10 different governments, the largest of those are the UK and France. It's disbursed over three billion to Gavi, which accounts for over 20% of its funding. And that was much larger in Gavi's earlier years, accounting for more like half of Gavi's funding. It's issued 38 bonds and raised over 8 billion from investors. It was founded back in 2006, but is very much active um, today um, in, in issuing bonds and in, and in providing funds to Gavi and securing commitments from governments. 
its raison d'être is that the key, this key benefit of the idea of accelerating the availability of money or front loading, in IFIM's words, the zero value vaccinating a child in 10 years time if he or she dies from a vaccine preventable disease this year. And how it does this is that if him receives these long-term legally binding pledges from donor governments, issues vaccine bonds off those uh, pledges and uses that money raised to fund Gavi. And in a paper, we've looked at uh, the politics of IFIM, the financing model, and looking also at the geography of it. But for today, our focus very much on looking at IFIM's financing model. And to do that, I want to walk through in a little bit more detail a simplified version of how the IFIM model works. So first, donor governments provide sign uh, irrevocable grant agreements to Gavi, who assign the right to receive that grant to IFIM. Off the back of those agreements, IFIM issues vaccine bonds and capital markets to uh, institutional investors, typically, and those, um, it therefore receives bond issue proceeds at that moment, which it can use to provide disbursements to Gavi, who go on to use it for their vaccine programs and health system strengthening activities. Donor governments later make a payment on their grant agreements as they're scheduled over typically 10, 15 or 20 years, every year a payment. And if it can use that to repay the interest and principal on the bonds that it's issued. Throughout the process, if it incurs various fees to private sector uh, institutions, the financial institutions to arrange the bond issuances and a range of professional services. I want to flash up a slight more complete view of the flow of money in if it also has significant operations with the World Bank as its treasury manager to manage a significant investment portfolio and is also involved in very significant volume of hedging transactions. So the three key themes I want to look at today and they're aligned with the three key benefits that proponents claim for the IFIM model. The first is this front loading of funds or making funding available today. The second is that it operates with low cost of funding. And the third is the idea of leveraging private sector funds. And what I want to do is using this follow the money approach, examine each of these three claims in turn. So first let's follow the money through the pledges and grants. So this is up to 2019 before some disruptions to IFIM's um, way of operating, let's say, um, begun with the pandemic. So these, these figures are from 2006 when IFIM started up to 2019. And by that point, donor governments had agreed to pledge six and a half billion dollars to Gavi. And IFIM had disbursed 2.9 billion to Gavi. And it had 400 million on its uh, balance sheet. That's liabilities that it was going to commit to paying to Gavi. So we'll include those as well in funding that Gavi was going to receive. So the question is, what's really the front loading and where did the rest of the money go, the difference between the six and a half billion and the about three and a half billion that Gavi would receive? Now, first, looking at the um, funds that Gavi's received in uh, orange and the, the promises that government's made in blue, what, what we can see is a very clear front loading effect, especially in the first few years. So the sums that Gavi receives from IFIM significantly outstrip um, the funding that governments have had to pay to, um, to IFIM. So that pulling forward and making the funding available sooner of the six and a half billion in promises, making 2.2 billion available only in those first couple of years. But the effect does significantly tailor off even though IFIM is signing new, um, new pledges and issuing new bonds. And what's hiding in plain sight between these, this front loading is high costs. And those costs of IFIM's operating model represent a significant profit opportunity for certain actors. And what we find in following the money through 
is that over a billion has been paid in interest and in redemption payments that are made above the issue price to bondholders. $33 million have been paid in fees to financial institutions to, for the bond issuance. 22 million have been paid in fees to professional services firms, so that's mainly lawyers, auditors, insurance. And then 29 million has been paid in fees to the World Bank who acts as IFIM's treasury manager. And altogether, what this means is that we find over a billion dollars has been uh, paid out and in, in forms that represent some kind of return or profit for those actors receiving them. As points of comparison, this sum of over a billion represents 35% of the 3 billion in donor payments that have been received so far, and 17% of the 6.5 billion in donor pledges that have been made up until this point. So it's a significantly expensive uh, model. And finally, turning to that third claim around leveraging private sector funds, which underpins a lot of the narratives in health uh, financialization more broadly, is that we find no real additionality in aid. So IFIM is borrowing from private sources, from the bondholders, and temporarily these go to Gavi. But ultimately, donor governments are the source of the payments to Gavi, and the rest is channeled to the private sector in the form of interest and fees. So the reality we find is rather the opposite of mobilizing and catalyzing private resources narratives. And instead, we find that non-trivial resources are peeled off by private financial actors as money flows through these innovative finance schemes. So if we look at a summary of the findings, there's some front loading effect that's quite significant in the first couple of years, but limited impact later on. And in fact, we find the opposite of a low cost of funding that the model is very expensive and it rather uh, resources are peeled off to the private sector rather than leveraging them as such. So given these fairly significant opportunity costs, the question is, are there alternatives? And I've come at this in two ways that first we could think about an alternative financing model where donor governments would borrow through long-term bonds themselves to fund Gavi directly, which delivers the same front-loading effect for Gavi at a lower cost of uh, funding. And it would also be have some benefits of being more open to democratic scrutiny and not have the same concentration around existing financial uh, centers and actors who then take on that role um, in global health. So this would be an alternative financing model aiming at delivering the same front loading of funds for health, but with slightly fewer opportunity costs. Or we could think about identifying a different problem. So rather than taking IFIM's approach of diagnosing the problem of access to immunization for children in low income countries as an investment gap, we could rather look at a range of different problems around uh, high pharmaceutical prices, healthcare infrastructure, or the ability for um, the Gavi target countries to raise sufficient taxes. And along with those, there could be a range of different solutions around intellectual property right law, grant funding, or other forms of direct funding, or some reform to the international tax system. And the, po the point here is that given these very significant opportunity costs to show that there are alternatives to uh, this financialized approach and innovative finance approach to healthcare. So I'll wrap up with a few uh, conclusions. The, the first is, is that it's worth uh, still re recognizing that if it has made a significant contribution to global health, in including to the COVID-19 response in terms of mobilizing funds for vaccines. But a detailed examination of its financial model, taking this follow the money approach reveals very significant opportunity costs. And this model 
pre any a key one among those costs is that there are significant opportunities for private profit hiding in plain sight in the context of explicit social goals. And while IFIM front loads aid, there's no aid additionality. This narrative of catalyzing and mobilizing private finance, we find instead rather the reverse is happening. And then finally, again, to emphasize that there are alternative uh, financial models and alternative solutions. Thank you very much for this uh, <laughs> flabbergasting presentation. I mean, the visualization of uh, the mechanics of IFIM and the structures of IFIM also tell a lot about uh, its uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, opacity, its obscurity. It's impossible to really enter into those uh, uh, architectures because uh, it's uh, made up of so many private actors who don't actually, you know, stipulate public contracts. They don't stipulate uh, treaties. They stipulate private arrangements, and therefore these are not at all visible to us. Uh, you rightly raised the, the problem of uh, public scrutiny and the democratic, uh, you know, scrutiny into this uh, huge this giants of global health today. Eh? And I think it's a, it's a, it's a very important uh, uh, representation, you know, visualization of the problem that you are presenting with the IFIM. I remember when uh, I was following, following for a few years, uh, the solidarity group on, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the leading group on solidarity levies. It was a group of countries that were actually I was pretty critical of IFIM then, and especially of the advanced market commitments that have been reproposed with COVAX, uh, but uh, which are really another very costly mechanism and basically a subsidies to the private sector from the public sources, a very, 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 uh, you know, alarming, alarming way. And, and finally, I would like to make a remark uh, on, on the point that you raised about we cannot deny the you know the the, the good done and the, and the outcome uh, in terms of uh, immunization of children of course this is very important and everybody talks about immunization today I see two risks here the fact that of course immunization was very important uh, during the alma ata days you know you didn't have to get uh, Gavi to really roll this uh, uh, global health uh, agenda. Uh, in fact, uh, it was it, it, Gavi was structured to basically encapsulate uh, the vaccine production, research production, and distribution according to a clear medicine model, uh, and that is a uh, it's a new business model around vaccines which didn't exist before the PPPs were created. Vaccines, however, and immunization was precisely one of the big uh, one of the big uh, operational lines uh, of the Alma Ata uh, conference. And the second thing that we needed to highlight is also some sort of longer term governance repercussions and governance you know, implications of these structures. I think uh, we cannot measure the benefit of these entities only counting individual immunizations uh, you know, uh, given. I think of course this is very important, but we, we, I think we, we need to um, refine, I believe, uh, as you do, <laughs> uh, refine our, our glance on these things, because this is exactly how they bought the, 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 the NGOs and the, the non, non-profit world into this, you know, saving lives, uh, immediate solutionism, but we know that health is not only biomedical interventions, it's actually so much more than that. And uh, this is, I believe, in political and cultural terms, one of the greatest dangers and one of the worst things that have happened with the financialization and the privatization of health, that only one approach is considered the natural approach, and it isn't. Anyway, thank you very much, and sorry for commenting so long. It's, uh, you, you all instigate a lot of thoughts, uh, but I would like uh, to give the floor now to uh, Felip uh, Stein, uh, Felip, uh, uh, Fe sorry, Felix. Uh, Felix has, uh, uh, in a way, uh, you know, um, tried to uh, develop uh, the uh, analysis on, on financialization of uh, the latest creature, the pandemic creature, 
which is a COVAX. A COVAX uh, uh, is, uh, has, has been uh, really under very uh, uh, harsh criticisms for non-delivering, but also for its uh, mechanism, its, uh, its internal organization and its governance uh, a precedent that he creates in many ways. And uh, I'm very happy to have uh, uh, Felix Stein here. Felix uh, is an economic anthropologist at the Center for Development and the Environment at the University of Oslo. His fantastic research also uh, focuses on global health financing, especially financial instruments created to fight pandemics. And uh, uh, I think, uh, what we hear from Felix now is extremely important because together with your analysis on IFIM, Sarah, this is all the debated models uh, at the WHO in the context of the pandemic treaty negotiation. People are not ready to learn the lessons and to see the downsizes of these creatures. They want to continue promoting them. And therefore, I think it's very important to have also you, both of you in, 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 this, uh, in this panel to make comparisons so we will, I think, uh, uh, dig later in the discussion and, and see what uh, is uh, still being uh, proposed as the solutions. Felix, you have the- Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for this uh, really intimidating introduction and for putting this amazing panel together. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. We can, um, yes. And so, yeah, I'm going to speak uh, about COVAX, which colleagues and I at the University of Oslo have been trying to understand since it was first founded in uh, April of 2020. Um, and uh, I'll begin by briefly mentioning a couple of general features of financialization uh, in global health in general. And then I'll provide an example of how it played out practically in the creation of COVAX. And I'll argue that COVAX can largely be understood as an example of uh, what highly financialized global health looks like. So, I'll tr yeah, I'll, I'll try and tease out its exemplary features uh, um, when it comes to financialization of global health. And I'll end on some implications of uh, what the COVAX approach to pandemic response may mean for global health governance. Um, and so the term financialization, the way I, I use it and have used it with colleagues, uh, is that it usually refers to the fact that global health governance is becoming increasingly oriented towards financial concepts, motives, practices, and actors. Um, uh, but that doesn't really tell us what financial means, right? And so in my mind, what uh, uh, a good way to distinguish finance from other forms of economic activity, uh, which may be based, for example, on the production uh, or trade of physical commodities, uh, is that in finance, capital accumulation primarily happens by relying on existing money, on contracts and time. For me, those are the three key ingredients that make the cap uh, capital accumulation of uh, finance uh, possible. Um, and that uh, for global health, that means that banks and investors get more powerful, that the ways in which financial instruments and contracts are structured matters more than ever before. And we've seen how detailed uh, you need to get as an analyst to understand what is happening. So it's uh, that, that has big consequences for the research that we do. Um, and the financialization of global health also means that new sets of ideas start to dominate our thinking and our, our practice. Uh, and they include return on investment, investment risk, human capital, and so forth. And importantly, financialization changes the nature of operations of both the private and the public sector. So on the private side, uh, the work of Susan Sell, amongst others, has shown that um, financialization allows pharmaceutical companies and medical device manufacturers, for example, to get much bigger and much more powerful. Uh, it puts them into a better position to engage in lobbying and rent seeking better than before. And we've seen pharmaceutical companies heavily engaged in both of these activities during the COVID-19 outbreak such as when Johnson & Johnson, for example, threatened the Belgian government that it might rethink its billion dollar investments in the country if Belgium backed the TRIPS waiver, uh, or when Pfizer asked South Africa to put up sovereign assets as collateral for vaccine contracts, uh, or when Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, and Sinovac ensured net profits in 2021 of around 50 billion US dollars uh, at profit margins of between 62 and 76%. 
Uh, and another feature of a highly financialized private sector, I think, uh, is that it tends to get increasingly reliant on intellectual property, so as to keep most of the added value that's created uh, along global value chains with investors, rather than sharing it with blue collar labor around the world. And we can see this uh, during the pandemic insofar as profits and tax revenue associated with COVID-19 vaccines remained mostly located in the global north such as when BioNTech made a net profit of 10 billion euros in 2021 and paid 3.2 billion euros in taxes in Germany. Uh, but financialization also affects the public end of global health, health governance and the, the governments of high income countries are increasingly reliant upon and influenced by large corporate actors. Um, and this is a general trend in financialized economies that is then amplified uh, in epidemics and pandemics when these corporations also provide essential medicines and countermeasures of all sorts. So again, for example, uh, government reliance on corporate support was exemplified by Germany's opposition to the TRIPS waiver, which South Africa and India had first suggested in October in 2020, but then which was then only agreed after almost two years of stalling uh, in June Alex, of 2020. Sorry, sorry for interrupting you. I'm told that you have to be speaking a bit more slowly for the interpreters. Right. Thank you, sorry for... Yeah, so when the when the TRIPS waiver was eventually agreed upon, uh, COVID had already killed several tens of millions of people, over 12 billion vaccine doses had already been administered, and global vaccine demand had plummeted. But the financialization of the public sector in global health doesn't just arise organically from changes in this broader political economy, uh, as the other speakers have pointed out, but it's also driven by a specific set of institutions including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Bank, the PPPs that you have mentioned, and I would add to uh, the global, uh, to the ones that have been mentioned, the Global Fund and CEPI, um, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innov uh, Innovations. Um, and they um, blur the lines between financial investments and investments in health and between public health risk and corporate financial risk. Uh, so really, uh, a fine-grained and detailed discourse analysis, I think, is one of the uh, tasks that uh, we have to engage in in a more financialized environment, more so than in other uh, uh, political and economic settings. Now, one way to understand financialization uh, uh, concretely is to look at COVAX. And as you all know, COVAX was created in early 2020 as a disease-specific public-private partnership meant to speed up the development of COVID-19 vaccines and to ensure their equitable distribution worldwide. So those were these two, two uh, objectives that it had was to speed things up and ensure uh, equitable distribution. And it was the vaccine arm of a broader technology specific cooperation effort against COVID-19 called ACT A. And COVAX aimed to deliver at least 2 billion vaccine doses uh, to countries around the world within the first two years of the pandemic to prevent global vaccine equity, but it ended up delivering less than half of this amount in the given time frame, uh, and thereby uh, it failed to prevent what the head of WHO, Dr. Tedros, ended up as describing as uh, global vaccine apartheid. And by that, he was just speaking about the fact that by September of 2021, so almost, again, two years into the pandemic, only 3% of the population of low-income countries had been vaccinated with at least one dose, uh, compared to the 60% in high-income countries at the time. And COVAX is often not considered a total failure because it did become the world's largest multilateral vaccine donations hub. Uh, and that's, I think that's a, that's a reasonable point. Uh, and it consistently made the case for multilateralism in very nationalistic times. So, um, but what I wanted to foreground about COVAX here is that originally it constituted, I think, a largely financial solution to a global pandemic. Uh, and this shouldn't come as a surprise because COVAX was mostly run by Gavi and CEPI and created uh, under the guidance of the Gates Foundation and the World Bank. And so the first way in which COVAX uh, exemplified financialization is that it started out as a buyer's club, a, a vaccine buyers and distribution club hoping to purchase vaccines uh, on behalf of all of its member states, and then and trying to uh, uh, distribute them across the world with the help of UNICEF and PAHO. And it aimed to first cover 3% of all the world, all the countries' populations uh, in the world, all its member countries, but, but they were numerous, and to protect, uh, uh, and thereafter, once uh, health and social care workers had been protected with vaccines, thereafter covering up to 20% of the populations uh, of all high-risk adults. 
Uh, and this idea of a buyers and distribution club uh, is, you know, that's that's largely a financial mechanism, but it promised several advantages. Uh, it promised to reduce global vaccine inequality and thereby uh, the spread and severity of COVID-19. Uh, it enabled individual countries to buy into a large pool of vaccine candidates and to reduce some of their risk of ending up without a viable vaccine. And the third advantage was that uh, it promised the um, increasing price control over vaccine companies by reducing competition between the countries that need to buy vaccines and by reducing information asymmetries between them as well. Uh, and in fact, early COVAX documents aimed, they, they were very explicit about you know, price control and they aimed at cost plus contracts with only a small profit margin for vaccines during the acute phase of the pandemic. So that meant that people purchasing the vaccines wanted to, much to uh, wanted to know how much it costs to produce them and then you know agree on a margin that they would be happy to pay on top of that unfortunately uh, covax's early uh, vigilance regarding vaccine prices was lost over time uh, and oxfam estima uh, estimated that vaccines could be made for as little as a dollar 20 uh, in 2021 Felix, i have to ask you again sorry i have to ask you again to slow down yeah. interpreters sorry. find it very hard sorry Okay. This is a bit dense, I apologize. Uh, but COVAX uh, paid on average nearly five times more. Uh, uh, and more importantly, COVAX uh, didn't systematically uh, publish vaccine pricing data or any other contractual details. So the crucial advantages that a buyer's club uh, could have brought weren't realized. And this lack of focus on transparent and appropriate or fair pricing in a major pandemic was all the more surprising given that the second major intervention of COVAX was to subsidize vaccine development. So COVAX documents consistently presented pharmaceutical companies as, as suffering from being too risk averse uh, to increase investments in essential pharmaceutical products. And so it argued that the pharmaceutical industry in times of crisis really needed push subsidies, that is money to boost pharma R&D and manufacturing capacity. And so, for example, the Gates Foundation provided $150 million uh, uh, early in the pandemic to Gavi, which in turn passed these on to the Serum Institute of India to provide it with capital to help increase vaccine manufacturing capacity for AstraZeneca and Novavax uh, vaccines. And according to COVAX, uh, pharmaceutical companies also needed pull subsidies, such as volume guarantees, so you guarantee how much of a vaccine you're going to buy, as part of committing to, uh, uh, yeah, um, as part of co committing to buying an overall quantity of vaccines, either from an individual manufacturer or from the market in general, uh, and an overview of corporate subsidies uh, provided by Covax has so far not been established. So Covax does not disclose how much it provides in subsidies, uh, and neither does it report on whether and how it measures the effects of said subsidies or what it managed to negotiate in return, okay? And this is very surprising, I think, for three reasons. One is that this pandemic already saw a major rise in corporate subsidies when it was happening. And these included grants, uh, such as $5 billion from the American government to vaccine manufacturers, uh, or uh, close to half a billion from the German government to BioNTech. Uh, but vaccine manufacturers also received tens of billions of dollars in subsidies in the form of advanced purchasing agreements or APAs. And the Dutch Center for Research on Multinational Corporations estimates these to lie somewhere between $45 billion to $90 billion. Uh, and again, it's hard to put an exact number on those because all COVID-19 related APAs remain undisclosed until today. And lastly, uh, all major pharmaceutical companies already began developing their own COVID vaccines and treatments very early in 2020, just when this crisis broke out. So the case that all of them urgently needed subsidies to even get going with their research uh, and their vaccine production, it really needs to be nuanced and needs to be investigated. And so when our research team put such you know, shortcomings to COVAX uh, policymakers, we were told that uh, at times that they may have been a little naive in negotiating with pharma companies during the pandemic and in focusing so much on subsidies and so little on uh, um, public bargaining power or pricing, for example. But I don't think naivety sufficiently explains what happened here. 
Uh, and when we look at the history of these subsidies, particularly of AMCs, we find that COVAX's focus on these subsidies with few strings attached echoes Gavi's policy and its long-term work on pneumococcal vaccine subsidies over the past 20 years. And in fact, these subsidies were first developed by a working group in the early 2000s that included members of the Gates Foundation, the World Bank, and the Washington-based think tank Center for Global Development in this report that I have here, uh, where they were developed as an alternative to temporary changes in intellectual property regimes in times of pandemics. Okay, so they have a long, a long history, and so, so this is not arbitrary. Uh, and recently, Gavi's outgoing CEO, Seth Berkeley, argued that future multilateral pandemic preparedness efforts will require, and I quote, publicly subsidized markets for pandemic vaccines. So Gavi still pushes for this uh, subsidies and no strings attached model. Now, a third way in which COVAX was a, a highly financialized solution uh, against the global pandemic is how it raises its own funds. And we've already heard about the IFM bonds that Sarah described that it used, um, but it also used private sector donations and was very vocal about those throughout the pandemic, you know, thanking the private sector donors, donors uh, for the money that they provided. Um, but both the bonds and the private sector donations, which are often also hailed as innovative financing, um, uh, must be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, so uh, on the one hand, they're hailed as being very important. So for example, mixing public and private financing or blended finance was one crucial uh, ingredient that uh, ensured that the World Bank was going to be the host of the pandemic funds that has recently been established because the World Bank has these trust funds called um, uh, financial intermediary funds or FIFs, and they managed to attract money from the public and the private sector. And that was one of the key assets for the pandemic fund to be hosted by the World Bank. So this is, this is seen as something really important. Uh, but Sarah already explained that if in bonds are exceedingly expensive and likely provide no additional aid money, uh, and the private sector donations, I think, are a wonderful thing. But if we look at how much the private sector provided to COVAX, it's, uh, you know, it's up to 5% and not more. Uh, so most of the money that COVAX used, 95%, uh, comes from the public sector. And so uh, in conclusion, um, I think that COVAX is largely the result of, of this kind of, of these longer term trends of global health financialization. And it, it tries to respond to a pandemic with these kind of micro microfinance mechanisms. Uh, so with a buyer's club, corporate subsidies, and with new and clever ways of raising private money. Uh, and importantly, in all of its efforts, uh, COVAX systematically favors private sector support without requiring even a minimal degree of contractual obligations or accountability or transparency in return. And so when it be clear that COVAX's financialized approach to global vaccine equity failed, and when calls for alternative measures became really loud in mid-2021, COVAX members insisted that they were the only solution for global vaccine equity, and that alternative solutions were misguided, or as some of them put it, stupid. Uh, and this insistence on being the one-stop shop for, vac for global vaccine equity, in spite of uh, evident failure, uh, it was so strong that some activists and some global health scholars now are arguing that COVAX's main goal was to protect the private sector from higher taxes, cost disclosures, production quotas, target prices, or IP interference. Now, I personally do not go that far in my analysis, mostly because the formal and informal conversations that I have with people who were involved in COVAX don't support this interpretation of a hidden agenda. Yeah? Um, but what I think is true is that the kind of financialization that COVAX stands for is really heavily lopsided in favor of the private sector. And so one of the questions that I still have in this panel is whether we are concerned at all with financialization as such, or just with the rise of private finance more specifically. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Felix. Uh, very, very good. Uh... Uh, points you have raised, uh, I would uh, pick uh, the sentence of the many that I could uh, pick from your presentation, but the one that actually, in a way, answers your last question. And it is the sentence that you said, it's hard to put the right numbers behind this, you know, so it's not just a question of privatization of the health domain, but it is, uh, I think, uh, 
precisely what uh, uh, the impenetrability for researchers, uh, for civil society actors, the declining possibility for the public, for the society to scrutinize what is going on. And I think uh, this is really the long-term effect of, uh, of uh, the, 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 you know, the, the prism that we are building and that we are trying to illustrate this financialization, which of course also does produce uh, effects of privatization or as uh, uh, one of the intervention from Dr. Shukla is here in the chat says the corporatization of healthcare. So distancing, progressively mm -hmm. distancing healthcare from the domain mm -hmm. and the culture of rights. That, that I think is, uh, is really what uh, uh, represents our concern. I, I really want to thank you all uh, for, uh, for uh, this very, very bri brilliant presentations. And uh, we have time now to, um, to uh, open up uh, the, the debate to open up uh, the Q and A. Uh, I, I see a lot of uh, uh, very positive comments on your presentation, but I really would like to uh, invite uh, uh, those uh, people attending to to take the floor and to raise your points uh, and and to speak. I don't necessarily see the hands of everyone, so I. Um, uh, or, or, or maybe also to write, uh, uh, yes, uh, to write uh, uh, comments and uh, questions on the chat. Now, I see one here from uh, Liang Chong Yu. Uh, what do you think about the financialization of pharmaceutical research and development? For example, the development of new medicines often requires a large amount of research investment. So pharmaceutical groups often use uh, this excuse to claim that the prices of uh, newly launched medicines must be relatively high in order to recover the costs. However, the R&D component bored by pharma groups does not seem to be as high as it is advertised to be. Uh, now, the question is, is this prevailing model of drug development today sustainable? What do speakers uh, think about it? Yes, so this is the first question. And then, uh, um, uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Shukla, please, uh, uh, you have, uh, I'll, gather, uh, I'll gather a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Shukla, you speak, you raise your hand, and therefore I didn't see it, I'm sorry. Please, ask your question. Thanks a lot for this uh, great panel. And uh, uh, I missed Marco's presentation, but I heard all the others and uh, they're really insightful. Um, and thanks, Maria, for uh, bringing out the entire impact of PPPs and, of course, the role of financialization. In uh, So my main, main point, which I've very briefly uh, hinted at in the chat box, is that the complement to financialization, which is flowing from the North, is also corporatization of healthcare, which we are seeing, especially in middle-income and lower-middle-income countries. And India is probably one of the leaders in that. And all that finance is flowing into, <laughs> preferentially flowing into not small hospitals or charitable hospitals or you know private practitioners. It's flowing into large corporate chains. And these large corporate chains are totally reshaping uh, the healthcare scenario in countries like India. And uh, that uh, it has its own impacts, uh, multiple impacts. So we need to put together these two parts. I mean, there are many parts of the picture, but I think that part was a bit uh, like uh, uh, not adequately emphasized. So maybe in, in, you know, in our discourse, we need to powerfully present what are the social impacts, what are the health system impacts uh, you know, of corporatization of healthcare, which is completely fueled by the financialization of healthcare. Because if we don't put those pieces together, it looks like a, a sort of an analysis at a certain level, only looking at the inputs in terms of finance, but not looking at, at the, sufficiently at the impacts on the ground, which are flowing from corporatization. It's not just commercialization of healthcare. Commercialization of healthcare has been around for the last 30 years since neoliberalism, but corporatization is the new phase, which you probably need to emphasize more. I just wanted to add this point, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Rabbi Shukla. Uh, in fact, I think that Felix uh, tried at the beginning of his presentation to give a really nice anthropological kind of view on this uh, 
different facets, but uh, I think it's very important that you highlight again uh, the, the dimension of corporatization of health. So who wants to start uh, you know, responding to these first uh, two questions? Uh, who wants to start the floor? Uh, Marco, you want to start in order? Uh, yeah, thanks for the very excellent questions. Um, so about um, the, the question on uh, R&D and, uh, and, uh, and in, in pharmaceutical production, I mean, I think uh, the, the, the question contained already the, the answer. Um, we know that this model of uh, um, pharmaceutical uh, innovation is dysfunctional. Um, there is ample literature providing better alternative. Um, I mean, the, the Nobel Prize, uh, Joseph Stiglitz produced a lot of literature uh, showing alternative models um, to incentivize uh, pharmaceutical research uh, that doesn't involve uh, giving a monopoly to private companies, um, uh, a monopoly in price. Is, um, I mean, the, the biggest obstacle here uh, is the lobbying, is the lobbying of pharmaceutical companies. It's not that we don't know which are, which are the solution. The problem is that uh, we have uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies lobbying government um, every day uh, in Brussels, in DC, in Geneva uh, to uphold uh, intellectual property rights. Um, uh, despite all the evidence uh, that we know. Uh, about uh, corporatization uh, of healthcare, uh, yes, uh, we know very well that uh, the, the phenomenon of corporatization and financialization are strictly, strictly related. Um, um, I, I, I just want to, to make a little addition on the effect of, of uh, corporatization and specifically on promoting uh, private sector expansion. Um, this is not a neutral. It's not only that, you know, financing a private hospital doesn't benefit poor people. It only helps uh, rich people. Um, in uh, there is ample literature documenting that um, in low and middle income countries, financing private care uh, is to the detriment of uh, healthcare service provision for uh, for the public healthcare sector. Um, this is because um, if we look at the, at the statistics uh, in low in the income countries, we see how uh, the percentage of healthcare workers working in the private sector compared to the amount of the people that the private sector serves is uh, outstanding. Huh? Um, in uh, South Africa, uh, we have 75% uh, of the doctors working in the private sector, which serves only 10% of the population. This means that the private sector is taking away healthcare workers that should work for everyone huh? um, and putting them at their service only to the people, uh, only of the people who can afford this. And South Africa is one of the least extreme cases. It is one where we have good statistics but if we look at, uh, at uh, countries like uh, um, Uganda, Kenya, the, the percentages are, are, much, uh, are much worse. Okay. Um, okay. So we have effectively corporatization hindering the right. Thank you, Marco. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it, it, it is not an issue on naivete, as Felix said earlier. <laughs> it's a, a much more serious dynamic <laughs> ongoing. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone uh, of you wants to kind of respond uh, uh, further to these questions. I see in the in the meantime uh, that uh, uh, there are other questions emerging. Uh, for example, did the, the policies of Indian and Chinese governments uh, had some unique features in their vaccination policies 
even though financialization of healthcare is the clear trend of these countries as well. So, um, Uh, sorry, Nicoletta, you muted yourself. Sorry, sorry, by mistake. I, I, uh, I was wondering, Maria Jose, if you wanted to also in a kind of a second round uh, take these uh, solicitations coming from the panelists, from uh, the, the floor. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I would like to um, complement on the point on corporatization because um, uh, it is indeed uh, very, uh, very evident, um, and I think that makes sense to emphasize that. Uh, Marco um, expanded a bit on that, uh, but um, I, I think that over the years, um, and, and that's because I am doing research at the moment on the role of the World Bank, and, and I um, um, focused my intervention on that, um, I would say that yeah, the World Bank has been very instrumental in the uh, um, in the in the in the promotion of uh, this specific model of providing healthcare uh, with a very strong uh, uh, presence of the corporate sector. Right, uh, the case of India, uh, as you flag, uh, it's a it's a very telling example of that, and I think that we should. Um, we should uh, learn more from the very dramatic uh, example of uh, the result of uh, practices like this, right? Uh, as Marco Flag, the case of South Africa uh, as well. I think that um, we should be mindful of the very multiple manifestations in which uh, this takes place, right? As, as I said, it's not only privatized, it's not only commercialized, is a, a, a health system that is highly fragmented, uh, a health system that uh, it, it's uh, not working uh, for the for the delivery of healthcare for the ones that actually um, uh, do not have the, the the resources to to cover for that, and and health systems have been structured in such a way that they serve. Um, a very specific model that it's based on extracting profits and 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 and, and uh, having health as a commodity, right? So I think that this is a very problematic trend, and and uh, we should be mindful of all the different aspects of that. So thanks for raising that. No, I just wanted to uh, alert you all that Sarah uh, had to leave. She had uh, told us in advance. Uh, She's uh, really uh, grateful to you all. And uh, uh, I see that uh, uh, there are other questions uh, in the chat, but uh, before uh, you know, passing to the new questions, I would like to know if Felix wants to make uh, comments and actually answer to some of the points raised so far. Just really, really quickly, I don't have too much to say, but on R&D and financialization, I think, it, uh, and again, drawing on the work of Susan Sell uh, and others, I think it's um, what financialization does uh, on the corporate side is that it orients corporate activity more towards shareholders and, and a little, and it's not just profit, it's also shareholder value now that is uh, taken into consideration much more. Uh, and that is being structurally instantiated by the fact that CEOs get a, top CEOs get a lot of their pay just in shares, so they're very attuned to the share price and keep it up. And that means that uh, things like shareholder buy, buybacks happen more often yeah. in corporations yeah. than before. Yeah. Uh, and that um, uh, over time, and that's not good for R&D, because that's money that a corporation had that it could also be spending on R&D. And over time, we see that the share of R&D to revenues in corporations, in large pharmaceutical corporations, has gone down. So they're not, you know, the really big ones are not the most innovative. And when they do innovate, they will focus that innovation on where the biggest markets are. And they're not in, you know, the central health and medicine that saves all the lives, but they are in uh, often in cosmetic markets or uh, mar yeah, life lifestyle medication. And very briefly on India, uh, what really was important for COVAX was that India had an export stop uh, on vaccines. Uh, I think it was 2021. Uh, and COVAX was supposed to reduce everybody's risk of not receiving vaccines, but their risk reduction was really focused on technology, on having different kinds of vaccines, uh, uh, supporting different vaccine technologies. But COVAX had not thought about um, political or geographic risk. And so that, I think, was a steep uh, learning curve for them. Yeah, 
they call it market efficiency. I participated in several calls at that stage with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They insisted that this was uh, the model, market efficiency, okay? So <laughs> this was the disaster model for uh, actually the COVAX, uh, uh, the, the COVAX thing. Um, now, there is a question from for Marco from uh, IPEC Ren Vural, whom I see here. IPEC, do you want to kind of raise your question to Marco directly or do you want me to read it? I'm very happy to be with you all today. It's very interesting. It's not that often that I find people that make uh, so uh, common uh, um, joint research. Um, I, I mean, I was impressed by Marco's uh, presentation and he made a very important, uh, he presented a very important finding about how medical equipment facility was turned upside down, uh, like it shifted from supporting the small, uh, the narrative of supporting the small uh, producers towards uh, supporting the large multinationals, medical equipment uh, manufacturers, and how it allowed the uh, entry of finance capital into uh, funding uh, these producers. Uh, I just wanted to know if he has any insights about uh, the power politics behind this process, because in the presentation, it uh, because of time restrictions, I think he uh, made it very quick. Uh, so I would like to know uh, whether this uh, toppling down of the project was simply due to the constraints that were imposed by the lenders themselves, like they wanted to support larger producers. They didn't want to take on the risk of uh, supporting the small producers, or was there other political underpinnings of this project, if, if he has any insights? Uh, thank you for, for the question. Yeah, I realized I could have uh, spent a little bit more words on that last part. Um, so, um, I think that uh, um, by design, the, uh, it, it, it was not a design flow. Uh, I, think, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a feature of, uh, of uh, um, you know, uh, involving private capital that uh, whenever you do it, you always need to uh, kind of uh, 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 mediate between uh, the interest of the investors and the and the and the inter, and the development goal, which are conflicting interests, and eh? which are conflicting interests because because of course um, um, uh, if universal healthcare uh, is a service that should be for free and accessible to everyone, so um, trying to make in Trying to maximize uh, the the profit uh, is, is fundamentally incompatible. So the key here is that the project needed to be bankable. Uh, that means that a small loan was not interesting for 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 financial institutions. Um, so the loans needed to be large. Now, local investor, uh, local manufacturers um, uh, of, of medical equipment um, produce uh, rather cheap, rather basic me uh, medical equipment, um, like, um, for example, uh, uh, refur refurbished equipment, equipment to measure the blood BP. Um, uh, to, mo to monitor the BP um, um, uh, equipment for transfusions, all this e equipment, which is very much needed at the facility level, uh, especially in primary healthcare facilities, um, is not interesting for investors. Right? Okay, what is interesting for investors is very high end, very specialized equipment that costs a lot of money, that is not produced in countries like, uh, like Kenya, like. Uh, like um, in Cote d'Ivoire and others. Um, and so inevitably, this, the project ended up being targeting um, big private hospitals um, that um, uh, for, for expensive equipment and, and uh, foreign manufacturers. So um, 
manufacturers from General Electric, from Philips. Um, so yeah, um, I uh, I realized that uh, it 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 would require a few more more slides to to explain it more in depth. Uh, but I can share my my paper on the topic. Thank you, Marco. Yes, please, uh, Felix. I have a quick question also for the panel. I am wondering in all of these in all of these financialization mechanisms that we're looking at, um, they tend to be overly expensive and really convoluted and complicated. And I do wonder why donors play along. And I wondered whether you had any insight into that. I mean, why does the German government? Why does the American government? You know, why do they keep paying for these things if uh, if such large chunks of your development aid money is getting lost in the process? That's that's what I'm wondering. Thank you for this very provocative, uh, you know, question. I will just uh, uh, make a make an attempt at responding to you. Of course, uh, I think everybody knows that this is not the best way to go. They are very clear. You know, there has never been a triumphal kind of. Uh, uh, report from the private sector about PPPs. <laughs> there has never been because they know it doesn't work. It's actually, you know, Maria Jose who does this fantastic work of uh, uh, reminding us all that this system is actually leaking uh, inefficiency from everywhere. The WHO prepared recently the first ever report of its kind on PPPs, and it was trying acrobatically to kind of you know, defend the thing, which is clearly a, to a, a costly. It doesn't go to the right people, so much so that some governments have even dropped it. I mean, we have to own up to the fact that Turkey abandoned completely the model. So they do acrobatics in order to continue justifying. And if you look, Felix, I, I'm sure you've read the report, but if you look at the recommendations of the one public organizations that should be promoting the right to health, to tell governments what they have to do in order to be able to negotiate, frame, you know, and 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 have a bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the asymmetrical power players of the private sector in PPPs, you really you really ask, well, why should the government do that? I mean, why should the government set up all of this in order to do something that is not only a false solution, but it's a wrong, a profoundly wrong solution. So they, I, I think that the leverage on this has nothing to do with either efficiency or effectiveness, which are, by the way, the two market values that they continue, you know, promoting uh, for us. And when they, when they scrutinize the civil society and when they scrutinize even the, the public sector. So it, it's a really, it's a big dilemma, the one you have raised. And I, I would like uh, you, uh, Felix, and also Maria Jose to comment on a, a comment and a question that uh, I must have uh, missed in the chat, and I apologize for this. Uh, it comes from Bidut Mohantis, uh, who says that the financialization has had particularly adverse effects on rural and tribal areas as local governments act to funds, public funds, has shrunk, you know, significantly. So um, what is, this is another part of the prism, because then we also have to look at communities in local, in local, in local communities, uh, indigenous populations, where the needs are direst at times, and where there would be also some sort of, uh, you know, uh, solutions from a governance perspective that are damaging people in, in, in irreversibly at times. Felix, do you want to comment on this? And then Maria Jose. Yeah, I only have two brief points on this. One is that um, as we see private finances, uh, it's very attuned to whether and how they will make a, a profit as part of participating in anything, in any kind of blended finance system. Uh, and, and that is more likely in urban areas than in rural areas. So it may, you know, I, I haven't seen a good study of this, but um, I think it's a decent working hypothesis to have to say that there is a systematic anti-rural bias in financialization. So, I, you know, if anybody wants to do research on that, I think that that, that would be my guess. That's really interesting. And, and the second um, point uh, on financialization is that it sounds really abstract. It just sounds like a game of money and contracts. But of course, there is a link, a link to the concrete world somewhere. And very often that link... Um, uh, when countries are getting overly indebted as part of these financial games where, you know, debts can just blow up uh, in very little time, 
uh, then assets are at stake. And these are very often assets uh, uh, to do with the uh, um, uh, livelihoods of people uh, in the rural world. And Martinez Allier has been writing about, you know, the interplay uh, of debt and environmental degradation for the past 30 years. And there is something to say as part of moving into a territory of planetary health or one health or however you want to conceive of the link between health and the environment uh, that is un underexplored because uh, financialization puts a lot of pressure on, on that link. So I think that's a great question. Thank you so much, Felix, for raising this last point. A very, very important, very important. Uh, Maria Jose. Thanks. Um... I want to expand a bit on the first point that Felix uh, raised, uh, because in our research on uh, uh, PPPs in the health sector, we have seen that um, there is uh, clearly an, an, an effect or a, a bias in, in favor of uh, um, profitable projects in urban areas at, attending uh, or, or serving the middle class or the upper middle class. Um, and these, uh, given how expensive and risky uh, PPP um, deals um, are for the government, this, this puts a, a, a very high pressure on the government's uh, uh, health budget and budget as a whole, um, uh, undermining the capacity of the government to serve other areas uh, of uh, the, the population or other geographical areas that actually need public resources the most. Right, so I think that there is a very direct effect. So where the, this type of project goes, right, the most profitable area, but there is also an indirect effect, which is the one that uh, constrains the capacity of the public sector to act upon other other needs, right? And this is uh, this is very evident uh, in the case of PBBs, but in the case of also of uh, for-profit. Uh, uh, Private private hospitals, um, and and my final point um, it's also in relation to one of the last comments that is in the chat uh, on on PBBs in, in India uh, that now also accounts for um, uh, college um, uh, medical uh, well hospitals and medical college. Um, I I think that from um, the research that I have done on. Uh, so, uh, World Bank uh, Group uh, supported PPP what? hospitals, either uh, well, uh, supported uh, health projects, either through the IFC or through the World Bank. This is uh, this is very evident. So uh, it's not only the provision of medical services in um, um, in in, in, in uh, through clinics. Uh, it's also medical equipment, but more and more. Uh, big, uh, big um, uh, buildings, big uh, hospitals with uh, um, several floors, and and the provision of um, education related to health as well, right? And uh, through advisory services, the very important point is advising government on how to enable these projects to happen, right? And this is happening in India. Uh, but this is uh, happening also, um, well, the experience of Turkey, uh, the experience of, uh, well, now it's a, there's a lot going on in Uzbekistan, um, in, in other countries, uh, um, uh, it's, it's happening as well. So I think that these, these are trends that sometimes uh, we do not see the, the, the big things, uh, but uh, are, are uh, shaping up uh, uh, as we speak. Thanks. Thank you, Maria Jose. Yes, and I would like to add that these are not just the trends from the global south. This is something that we also see emerging and expanding in the global north as well, where we used to have at least, you know, universal public health systems that are progressively eroded by this phenomena. Um, uh, we have not. I have uh, here. We we are running out of time. I think we have to come to a close. I see. A question uh, that come from uh, IPEC again in the agricultural sector with its obvious impacts uh, on the rural side that there is a very important interaction between financialization and corporatization. Uh, Felix, you are asked to comment on that, uh, but before giving you the floor, we have not even mentioned the issues of digitalizations, which now come on board, especially with uh, 
you know, uh, with um, the uh, post-pandemic, uh, the post-pandemic times and immunity as a kind of uh, organizing principle. So this immunopolitics that is emerging uh, uh, after COVID-19 that, that uh, will expand further in, irrespective of the inefficiency of it, uh, this uh, connection between financialization and corporatization. Felix, I give you the floor and then I, I think we can, uh, um, yes, uh, come to a close then. Thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking of uh, work from political ecology that I uh, that I've been uh, reading, uh, which makes the link between uh, countries that are indebted and very often on financial markets and need to make up for that debt somehow and pay for that by uh, the increased uh, extraction of oil, of gas, uh, concessions to intensive agriculture as such, and th those uh, have a really strong impact on, uh, not just on the rural world in general, but also on pandemic risk. I mean, uh, uh, so, so that, that's, that's what I was thinking well, of. Felix, uh, I'm very sorry, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I was just referring to the finishing point of your presentation about financialization or uh, private finance you you made a last finishing point I was just wondering if you can elaborate on that that was my point yeah. sorry yeah very sorry I, I didn't I just didn't I don't want to throw out all of finance and financing the baby with the bathwater but I think that what we're looking at I, I, I think for example bias clubs are very interesting and can potentially be a really cool thing just that the way in which they were set up and implemented in COVEX totally didn't work but I'm not against ideas of, for example, regional buyers clubs, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the future, uh, that at least on a regional level allow some kind of increased purchasing power for countries uh, that need to buy essential medicines. Uh, so, so I think there are smart and clever ways of structuring public insurance and buyers clubs and all of these things, but we're not seeing a lot of the really positive examples so far. We just see these privatized examples that are overly costly. And so... Or, yeah, I, I'm I'm still interested in finance being potentially useful for global health, but not in the way that we're seeing it right now. That's all. Yes, uh, finance is <laughs> is useful for global health, uh, but of course uh, we need uh, to de-imperialize, to decentralize, and get out of that close connected network group of uh, individuals, investors, uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, global health players that uh, are dominating. Uh, the scene today. We, we see that uh, in the WHO, we see it in the negotiations on the pandemic prevention, preparedness uh, and response where practically prevention has disappeared and uh, it's all about preparedness and response. Uh, we see the connections uh, you know, between health and, and food, the health and food and tech lobbies that are uh, shaping the discourse about how we should be tackling the future pandemics. And it's basically the same guys. It's not the buyers club that you mentioned, Felix, but it's the power club that uh, is, uh, uh, keeps on uh, uh, dominating the scene. How to, how to kind of uh, you know, uh, contrast uh, this wave uh, of uh, financial power and policy power is, is a huge uh, challenge. And I think uh, the work that you are doing uh, as researchers to disclose, uh, debunk, uh, deconstruct the mainstream narrative is absolutely essential because unless and until we have the evidence that you have provided with COVAX that uh, Maria Jose provides with the World Bank, that Marco provides with the IFC, that Sarah provides with the much heralded IFIM, we cannot as civil society have the you know, arguments and the, and the really sound information that can build our counter narrative, our uh, opposition to this, uh, to this uh, um, solutions or false solutions rather. So uh, coming to, uh, to a close, uh, I really would like to um, thank you all, but uh, as we see it uh, for the present and the future, uh, there is not much promise of uh, you know, a U-turn, uh, as you know. Uh, the, uh, Maria Jose hinted earlier at the uh, World Bank uh, evolution roadmap that uh, actually is uh, conceiving of not only more of the same, but it also something new that is coming on board, like, uh, for example, securitization platforms, which would be a further advancement of you, what you, Felix, have represented with, uh, with COVAX. Huh? 
And uh, uh, this is really very, very concerning because it actually further distances and further uh, cre creates further opacity to the whole mechanism of uh, products, uh, processes around uh, global health. And also what we see, what we have witnessed to uh, at the last World Health Assembly last May is the creation of a world of a global health investors forum at the WHO. Now, uh, of course, we know that there is a, a positive investment for health, which is the one advocated for by Alma Ata, your long term investments, investing in the public. Uh, public structures in public uh, health services, also in the social determinants of health, because you know that, that, that that's where health needs to be tackled, not just as a disease. That social and the trade the determinants of health that are so, and the environmental determinants of health that are so important. But now everything is uh, looked through the lenses of short-term return on investment. So that what that's exactly what you said. It's investment that which has been. Uh, associated to the business model, the financial model of accelerated returns, opacity, and the presence, the excessive presence of the private sector. So now the WHO is asking for NGOs to advocate for this investment forum, which will be highly likely public money going to leverage the private sector or the risk, as Marco was saying, private investments. If this is the future of ODA, as it is the present, if this is the future of the WHO, we are not really in a, in a very comf in, in a comforting uh, future. And uh, this is to say what? This is to say that more of these conversations have to occur. Uh, it is a, a rather a sort of serious concern of mine, uh, and I guess of you, that uh, financialization of healthcare, which is a complex hardware model level of understanding health is uh, not particularly you know uh, trodden as a, as a as a pathway by civil society and there, there's a small group of us working on this and i also believe that we need to, to unite constituencies the health constituencies with the financial constituencies with the food constituencies also because more and more uh, the future is aligning and and, and creating a, a very united block of this uh, of, of these people towards the same solutions and towards the same uh, approaches, uh, whatever the, the matter. So uh, food, health, uh, uh, climate change, uh, and you name it. So we will need more of these conversations and we will have more of these conversations. In the meantime, I uh, express my sincere, deep gratitude, personal and as SID, of course, uh, to you all, uh, to the uh, colleagues from uh, Hong Kong and China that have uh, supported this, uh, this, this discourse, this uh, uh, dialogue to the people that have uh, come to the webinar and also actively participated. And last but not least at all to the interpreters who have been going on for over two hours uh, in, in, uh, in a difficult conversation, it's a very complicated technical conversation. And therefore, my gratitude goes to them because otherwise uh, this uh, dialogue would not have been possible. Thank you all very much and more to come. Goodbye.